to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he has made us acceptable in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Let's unite together our hearts in prayer. Our gracious Father, we are so grateful for such words that we have read. Give us a steadfast heart and uh, let your spirit be with us, Lord Jesus, especially to teach us, to admonish us in the couple of minutes that we should stay here, that we can be beneficial to the body of Christ. Or as the Bible says, that whatsoever the joint is bringing and is supplying is to nourish the body and you give the gifts to profit all. We pray that you should teach us Teach these our people, the audience that is uh, listening in, O oh Lord God, may you praise them. Answer the need and the request that we have in our hearts for. The need is so much, especially in this day. Lord Jesus, you know how the world is in conflict. But we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that we should not be distracted except, Lord Father, Let's keep our eyes of Father focused on thee, the only author and finisher of our faith. We ask these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, the scripture has spoken that uh, verse 7, that's where our, our emphasis is, in whom? Who is that whom? That is Christ. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So there is redemption through his blood. There is a, a forgiveness of sins. And this is according to the riches of his grace. Now, if we can turn together, because this book, it must be studied along with the book of uh, Colossians. If you want to have your anchor to know very well your book of Ephesians, then you cannot do away with the book of Colossians. And Romans is the foundation, the foundation of every gospel that you can ever have in the dispensational word which was given to Apostle Paul. It must be in Romans, everything. Romans is the foundation. That's where everything was laid foundational. That's where your forgiveness is taught. That's where your justification is given. That's where <clears throat> the payment is given. That's where most of your position, adoption, and the program to change you, to rapture you, they are in the book of Romans. Then what is compiled up, what is spoken to us in the book of uh, uh Paul, uh, uh, Ephesians and the book of Colossians, these are for our establishment. The other one is our foundation, then we must be established. Now in the book of Colossians, we read these words, chapter 1 from verse 3, it speaks these things. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. This is the same thing that we are reading in the book of Ephesians. Redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. If you read that word even, it means the redemption through his blood equal to the forgiveness of sins. So now this morning, we want to look on that uh, great uh, subject this morning, which is uh, redemp uh, redemption through his blood. What is redemption? When we speak about uh, redemption, uh, we are speaking about the word which in uh, a Hebrew or whatever Greek, it would just mean like a goel. And this word would mean rescue. But when you go to the old dictionaries, it has diverse definitions. And all these definitions speak about what it is that Christ has done. Now, it means to free from what distresses or harms. Such as uh, to free from captivity by payment of ransom. One thing that we want to understand that when we speak about redemption, it has with it something like payment. It is not just uh, God standing in heaven and then says, I've forgiven the sins of every person, just come on. But here redemption, when we speak about God being a redeemer, then we are identifying him as the only one that is ultimate to be able and to have the Values, or rather to be able to pay the price. Because every redemption, it has a payment. Hmm? Takes exact, uh, 
uh, that is exerted on what is required. So our redemption is not just uh, something that is given for free, but it has something that uh, payment has to be done. To, to, to be dealt with has to be paid. When you speak, for example, in our normal sense, when you buy something or maybe something has been captured and it's been indebted and uh, you, 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 you speak about a debt has been imposed upon a certain someone, then for you to speak about redemption, it means that the full debt that is required has to be paid, then you can speak that someone has been redeemed. So when we speak about the redemption and uh, the scripture speaks it uh, entirely that it is through his blood. We should look on uh, the use of the blood and why redemption had to have a price upon it and what it is to when you should live here without having accepted the price that was paid or that was targeted on your redemption. This is what we want to look on this morning. So we speak about that redemption. You get the price and you pay it. Then you buy back. In other words, it is a way of buying back to the original position. When you speak about uh, a brother, maybe he's been indebted and uh, the, 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 the creditor is now taking that person captive and is in captivity because of uh, circumstance. Now, if we speak about a goel, if we speak about a redeemer, if you speak about redemption, then you speak that someone has met the creditor and, and uh, is, is, is worthy enough and is rich enough, and he has paid the full price, so that he can be able to free the one who was indebted. So that from then on, from the time when the, when the price has been paid, you no longer require nothing except a person to go free. If it was captivity, the person has been free from captivity. If we can speak spiritually in a sense of sickness, the person has been redeemed from sickness and he has met Jehovah Rapha, he has met someone who has paid for his sickness. That's why he says by his stripes we were healed. The thing has got to take a a price upon it, that is when we speak about redemption. We are speaking about meeting the abridged price for liberation, for to take away the captivity. So this is what the scripture <coughs> is describing, that he has, uh, wherein he has about uh, verse 7, in whom we have redemption. In Christ we have redemption. Some of these things they should help us to understand the deity of Christ. Why he says in Christ we have redemption. We understand in the scripture in the Old Testament the teaching says God is our redeemer. There is only one redeemer and that is God. Then when we speak about Christ is our redeemer, then we are attributing the person of Christ as God himself. That's why you would say, I and my Father, we are one. Because there is but one Redeemer. There is one that is able to pay the price. Why is there a need of the price to be paid? And what price is supposed to be paid? And when was that price required? And for what reason is the price being paid by God? When you turn over the book, in the book of Genesis, perhaps you may not have all the time, but you can go there and refer God speaks to Adam after creating the spilt man. Then he told him, planted the garden of Eden, made a uh, form the man of the dust, and he told him everything. He says, everything that thou, uh, that thou sweest in the garden, thou made freely eat. But of the day thou shalt eat of this tree, which is in the midst of the garden, of the knowledge of the good and evil, thou shalt die. So in other words, God has said it is his justice that he pressed death upon disobedience. And he says, if thou shalt not obey, thou shalt die. So the penalty, the wage of unbelief, the wage of sin, as the scriptures in the book of Romans, the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if the wage of sin is death, then it means wage requires a certain payment for someone to be freed from death. 
You cannot speak that now people are free from death. There is no longer death if you say, or I mean, if Christ comes on the scene and stands out and says that he that believeth on me shall not uh, die, but is passed from death unto life. When these people who have believed, they were sinners. There is a price that was required upon the sin which has uh, which was holding them captive. But you've come and given them the word, and these people are supposed to believe. So if you are supposed to believe, the justice of God requires that also the payment which was necessary for the reason of their sin should also be paid. So this is why Christ is coming and interposing his life and in whom we have the payment of the price that is necessary to free us from the life of bondage and sin. That's why you have to find several scriptures in the Bible uh, speaking and describing about the price that was uh, that was paid so that we can be able. In uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 19, he says, What? Know ye not that your body, the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. So, for your temple to be, your body to be the temple of the Holy Ghost, the scripture typically say, you was bought with a price. A price was exerted upon your purchase, so that you are not your own. So that you don't think your own. So that don't, you don't do things the way you want to do. So you don't give a habitation, a dwelling place of your body to anything. It is some other person's possession. That's why the Bible says a purchased possession. The Holy Spirit that is beginning uh, been uh, grieved, not the Holy Spirit of God, wherein uh, uh, that's been given to you a seed at the day of redemption. And the Bible says also in Roman, I mean Ephesians chapter 1, it says that he has given us what? This, uh, in whom we, uh, in whom, verse 13, in whom we trusted after that you had the gospel of your salvation, uh, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased Possession. It is something that, that is possessed by another person. When you have redeemed what you've redeemed, now the owner, the captor, has no longer any claims upon something that has been redeemed. That's why we can speak and uh, in the spirit speak about freedom that has been given to us. That's why we can say nothing can separate us from him that has paid the price for our freedom from the life of sin. So when the Bible says he has fully paid the price, he abode with the price, therefore glorify him who paid the price, and this in your body, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, it is speaking that this redemption has made you, freed you from a certain uh, a master to make you subject to another master. I think that is what Romans chapter 7 describes. When he says that uh, when the, the Lord states that uh, as long as the husband is alive, then you are not free from his law. But when he's dead, then you'll be free to be married to another. So also, when we are also seen, I mean, uh, captives to the life of sin, we was in bondage, we were servants, we were subject to serve that kind of life. But now that we have been redeemed, that someone has fully paid the purchase, has fully paid the uh, the purchase for the possession, then he continues and says that glorify therefore God in your body we and in your spirit which are God's. Meaning redemption was not only given upon this your body, it is also given upon this your spirit and the blood is what has been given to the atonement. It is the blood that atones for the soul. In other words it pays the price for the soul to be redeemed. The soul that sinned that soul shall die. So meaning the death that was upon the soul, Christ has fully paid the price. So when we speak about redemption, we speak about the payment of the price for the freedom. So in Christ we have this redemption and this is through his blood it is not through the sayings of man it is not through 
what uh, the churches give it is not through a certain church, not through the certain person. It is only God that is able to redeem. It is only God that is able to pay the price. That's the same thing I think, I think he also mentions in the book of First uh, Corinthians, which is chapter seven and verse twenty twenty three. He says, "Ye are bought with a price." Be ye not the servants of man. You are bought with the price. The price was fully paid. So therefore, be ye not the servants of man. It is a purchase that has been given. It's the price that has been uh, exerted. Now, this is why you have to honor this redemption. That's why you have to fall in reverence him. Because the value is upon who paid the price. The value of the redemption you have, the amount of forgiveness you have, the much trust that you're supposed to have is depending on who paid the price. If it's just a man that paid the price or a usual person, that you may not so much of trust that maybe your price has been complete. But when it comes that it is God, which is your Redeemer, and in Christ he has given the blood, and this blood is supposed to stand for your forgiveness, equal, even the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins equal to the purchasing price that he has given. That's why in the book of Acts uh, chapter 20, he speaks some of these things. Chapter 20, verse 28, he says, Take it therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Acts chapter 20 specifically tells us what he paid for a purchase. Many things, if you go to the book of uh, Exodus, Chapter 30, it tells you about if you should go and number the people, then these people must be redeemed. A purchase should be made. And God would accept that the money should be paid half a shekel. If you're rich, you don't pay much because you're rich. If you're poor, you don't pay less just of your position of poverty. But he put a price which he knows both the rich and the poor will be met within the same atonement, within the same price. Every one of them should be catered for. Exodus chapter 30. I just believe. Then what did he do? He would require that this money that you have paid, it should be for atonement to your souls. Now, when the Bible says... In, I think it should be in the book of Peter that we are not bought with corruptible things such as silver, such as gold, but we are bought with a certain price that you could not by no means as a man in your own ability able to pay. There is no one that could be able to pay the ransoming price which was exerted upon the reason of sin. When it is sin, the Bible says, the wage of sin should be death. In the day thou shouldest eat thereof, this day you should be dead. So in other words, it is all men that was in condemnation to death. Everyone, as the Bible says, is in Adam, all die. Everyone that is born of man, everyone that is in the image of this old Adam, they were subject to death by the reason of him that subjected all unto sin. But now the grace of God is interposed in this. That he that said, thou shalt die, now is coming forth to pay the price. And that is why the scripture says that he has purchased with his own. Who own? With God's own blood. He has done that one with his own blood. Not an angel's blood. Nor any other person's blood. But God creating the blood cell. This head of the new creature. In the womb of Mary, the word was made fresh. And if it was made fresh, then it should have what? Blood in it. That is in the book of uh, uh, John chapter 1. Which was with the Father in the beginning. Which you've heard, the same word was made fresh and dwelt among us. And he walked with men. And we handled the word of life. And we spake with him. That's how John is describing. And all the things he's done and he's come forth as a work uh, to do the work of redemption. And when the time has come, it is the Father's goodwill that he should pay the price. And in paying the price, the Bible says, he remained hung on that cross for three hours until everything, everything that is necessary was paid. 
So we are going to look on those things, how God has come forth and how his blood is become for the atonement of our souls. When you turn over to the book of uh, Hebrews, there is many things that we have got to pick from there. And then we can be able to appreciate the price that God has done, has given over our salvation. Then we can be able to appreciate and know when we believe God. Why do we have to trust that we are forgiven? What it is that God has done to us that surely has changed the course of our living. What it is that we have understood in God that our hearts are rejoicing and we can now free, freely stand and declare the freedom that is given to us. In the book of Hebrews chapter 9, he speaks certain things and he says, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. So there were words of the covenant, but there is what God is requiring for the covenant to be enforced. There is words of the covenant. Moses has spoken all the precepts of God. Just like Christ comes and he sets the principles of salvation, and he speak all the principles of, of, uh, of precepts of God as it was given to him. So now Christ comes, and then or rather Moses, he spake to the people everything according to the law. Then after that, he took blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and the people. So we have the book that was blood stained. That was blood sprinkled. We have the people who also have the blood sprinkle, sprinkled upon them. In other words, blood is also applied upon them. So we find out that in the matters of redemption, in the matters when God is dealing with his people, he places blood between them. Because the blood speaks as we're going to see. Blood has something in, in it. This is where God has ordained the price to be made. Then Moses was saying in verse 20, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined unto you. The word enjoined there, it is meaning that this is the blood of the testament that by this blood God is claiming you. In other words, you are declared as gods because of this blood relationship. When you have a father, when you have a son, then you speak about these people, share a blood relationship. Now when God calls Israel and you spoken to them the precepts that they should be, that should be kept, then the Bible says he gets the blood of calves, the blood of bulls, and I mean goats, then he sprinkles both the tap, the, the, the vessels, both the, 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 the book and the people, and says this is the blood of the testament. Which God has enjoined unto you. By this blood, God is claiming you. We find out the same thing. Christ is standing and he's taking the cup on the time of his, uh, of his taking the, the supper. And then he say, this, this is the cup. In this cup, this is representing my blood. And this is the blood of the New Testament. Which God is enjoining you. By this blood, it is God that is claiming you. Then you could start and say, unless you drink the blood of the Son of God and you eat His flesh, you have no life within you. In other words, God has no claim upon you unless you are under the blood. And you also have no claim upon God unless you come under the blood. So God has put a meeting point, a meeting position between Him and man, and between them He has pressed blood. Then you find out in the book of Genesis chapter 1, I mean chapter 4, when you find out uh, this man uh, Abel coming to worship somewhere in the book of Genesis, eh? you'll find out this uh, uh, brother in the book of Genesis chapter 4, verse 4, he says, And Abel, he brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord respect unto Abel and to his offering. When Abel is offering, God is respecting him because this man is going to bring the blood, and this blood that is going to bridge the gap because it is going to pay the price because in the blood you expect there is life, and this life is supposed to stand in the position. It has been spilled in place of another life. In other words, it is a ransom. Someone has ransomed. Someone has, uh, has paid the price that is needed, and it's Life that atones for life. That's why somewhere in the book, the Bible says that uh, God looketh to he that can stop the man that is falling down into the pit, into the 
pit if there is a ransom for his soul. If he can find a ransom. And then Christ is coming forth and the Bible says, this is the blood of the testament that the Lord is enjoining thee. The Lord is claiming thee by the reason of the blood. If there is no blood, God has no claim upon thee. If you have not accepted the blood, you have no claim upon God. If you are under the blood, then God will claim you no matter where you are. When the God gives this blood, my friend, it is something that shows God has paid the price and it is your, no longer yours. You're glorifying God in your body and in your spirit. And these things are God's because he has paid the price of it. In other words, he is the sole owner of what you are, of what your body is, what your spirit is. That's why we say that we are waiting for the redemption of our body. Some when we speak about adoption, we speak about it. We speak about the adoption that God has given to us this day and that we are enjoying and also speak about the adoption when he comes to redeem this body because they are God's. He has a plan for it and he has something that he has paid and he expects that they are his. That's why he has a plan to redeem it. He doesn't want to change it to become a glorified body because it is his. It is his temple. It is his. Not a temple of any person. No Satan can come and claim it. That's why he says, glorify God in your body, which are the Lord's. Now we speak about the enjoining, the blood of the testament, which God has enjoined thee. He has claimed thee by this blood. He is claiming thee, enjoining. That's why he speaks in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 and then verse 20. Moreover, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. So everything that was God's to be used, the tabernacle, the vessels, everything has to be sprinkled. When you just go to the book of Exodus, you just look on how God is sprinkling everything. How God is sprinkling the people. How God is getting the blood and he's sprinkling it over. But remember, this is the blood of the bulls. This is the blood of the law. The interposing of the blood it is by law. So everything, the Bible says, is by nature, or rather, almost everything is by law, purged with blood. So it is the law of God that necessitates the blood to purge, to redeem, to pay. So when we speak about Christ coming and paying the price, we are speaking about the judicial act. We are speaking about matters of the law. We are speaking about the fulfillment of the righteousness of the law, which Christ had to come, that he should fulfill, appease, complete, satisfy the righteousness of the law, so you could have a chance to have imputed righteousness, though you should not be able to pay this by the grace of God, he is going to get the righteous requirement of the law and impute it upon thee, because thou hast believed on him that justifies freely, in whom you have redemption. So it is the law's requirement that everything should be purged with blood. That's how the Bible is speaking. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is no remission of sin. This speaks about the justice of God. If God has said that the day thou shalt sin, or thou shalt eat thereof, that day you shall die, then the justice of God require that there should be death penalty paid to disobedience. Now if God is supposed to save you, then he must be able also to be able to meet the justice of his by paying the full price which he spake and exerted upon disobedience. Here, we don't have corners. We don't have shortcuts upon it. Heaven has no shortcut. When it comes to paying the price, heaven does not shortcut. Even God does not make a shortcut to have people packed in heaven without the price to be paid. Then you will understand why it is the justice of God that there should be hell to burn the unbeliever. Why is the eternal fire being kindled in the anger of God just because people have refused the justification of life so they will get the condemnation which is from the same God? Why is it necessary that you should believe? Now the Bible has spoken to us practically and plainly. It is speaking that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So if we have the forgiveness of sin... 
And it is given to us in whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness, Colossians says, even the forgiveness, the forgiveness of our sins is equal to the shed blood. Without the shedding of the blood, there is no remission. So God to remit your sin and to say that you are the righteousness of God through Christ, then he had to pay the price and this must be through the certain blood that he had to give himself. Now it was impossible, as the Bible says, the blood of goats and the bulls could not take our sin, but they would just cover sin, but the gracious God would allow a substitute of this God, of this uh, when we just go to the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, and look on what takes place on the time of atonement, we shall look on these gods coming, something which is the sin represented, something that has stood in the position of sin, that the sinner should go free. Now, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So, the sin that we say that God has for remitted, it is equal, rather, it is done by the shedding of blood. We say it, God's own blood. We said you are bought with a price. Why God pay the price so that he can remit your sin. This sin question, that's why there is no condemnation. So you are no longer a sinner. That's why there is now no condemnation to those who have accepted the application of the blood, the interposition of the blood, the position, the enjoining that has come by the reason of the blood. So the justice of God has been made through the shed blood. So meaning, the coming of Christ upon the cross, it is not just grace as per se, but it is God meeting his justice. The justification is been paid because there is a law that requires that there should be a shed blood for a testament. So the grace is only seen that he who is above all, who is holier than all, who is the worthy or the worthy of all worthiness, is the one that is saying, I'll go and pay this price. But otherwise, you should pay the price if you should not go to hell and yet you are born in the image of Adam. But then the grace of God brings him and he takes him to the cross to meet the justice of God. Hmm? The grace of God brings Christ to the cross to meet the justice of God. That's why the condition on the cross could not change a bit. He had to pay the full price. So therefore, you are no longer a servant. You are bought with a price and the price was fully paid. That's why you are not a servant to a certain man. You are not a slave to a certain doctrine of man, to a certain uh, captivity of a religion. You are not a slave to serve man, but you are supposed to serve the Lord Jesus Christ because you are his. He has enjoined you with his own blood. This is the blood of the testament that is shed for many. If you want to have life, then you should be able to know that there is a redemption that was given through the blood. There is a purchase that was given. Therefore, you are no longer a slave to anything, nor a slave to fear, nor a slave to bondage. Why? Because God must prepare you that you should leave this uh, horror of uh, captivity by sin into the glorious liberty of those whom he has freed from the power of darkness and to a marvelous light, or translated you from the power of darkness and to the glorious liberty of the kingdom of the Son of God, wherein you have been called, and by this you are partakers of a heavenly inheritance through the Spirit that He has given thee as a confirmation that the price was paid, and you have received the down payment. In other words, you have been a beneficiary of what has been done to you. My like brethren, this is something so great when you speak about redemption through His blood. Without His blood, I tell you, the Bible says, there is no remission. So who blood is going to be shed? No man could shed this blood. No angel could shed this blood. If an angel could come besides God himself and shed this blood, then it would require an angel to be a redeemer and yet we will not be, we still be held captive because the justice of God will not have been fully certified. So it took God. The world was made fresh. He dwelt among us. He humbled himself. Sacrifices and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared me. 
having found himself in this fashion like as a man he humbled himself even to death of the cross because it necessitated him to die on the cross for the many when I should be lifted up I should draw all men unto myself he that believeth he is passed from death unto life because he has believed on the paid price. He has believed on this blood that enjoined thee. So therefore the Bible says, he, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So meaning, all these other things that we see in the church, that you can pay certain fares, like in uh, our friend the Catholic, you have to pay certain fares, which this man is called indulgence, so that now you can be lifted from the place of purgatory, maybe in hell to purgatory, from purgatory, uh, purgatory to heaven. These are man-made. You will not just trust on such things like that. There is no any other sacrifice that you can make after the absolute sacrifice, the supreme sacrifice has been offered. There is nothing that you can you are told to offer to God that can be able to ransom your soul. Now, the only thing is to present, to make sure that your state is fine, to present your body a living sacrifice. But then, having, if you could have presented your body, if there was a law that would bring salvation, then Christ would have died in vain. There is no law that could bring this righteousness and impute it upon the people. They had to meet the righteous requirement of the law. But to have imputed righteousness is because some has satisfied the desire or the will or the, the righteous requirement of the law. Now this righteousness will be imputed upon thee through faith. If you should have faith on him that justifies ungodly, the ungodly free. That's why the book of Romans is in place and it is preaching and teaching how you have been able to get the justification of life through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. It's the blood that has been shed. So therefore, the book of Romans, it speaks about this necessity of the blood. And it was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these. Now, if you have been moving together with us some couple of times back, we spoke about the things in heaven. And these things ought to be sanctified. In the book of Job, we said this scripture. It is meaning that the heavens... He put his charge over, I mean, his, his angels, he charges with, and also the heavens are not pure before him. But the heavenly things themselves, they also needed a purification. So meaning, this blood was not acting, working on the, not only on the earthly inheritance, but also the purification of the heavenly things. And respect who these things are. Whether they be things in heaven, things on earth, that is where they should be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All the things were created by Christ and for him and they are waiting to be converted to him back. And that's the reason why he's paying, he's paying the full price so that the scotter, the claimer who had upon, claims upon them should lose all the claim. That's why the devil does not possess me anymore. That's why if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, the devil has nothing, anything. That's why the Bible says in the book of Romans, God shall bruise Satan, surely under your feet, because he no longer has claims upon you. Submit to God. Resident has to free, because he no longer claims anything upon thee. You have been bought with the price, you are summons. One day you were servants to sin and to uncleanness. Now subject your body unto servants of righteousness, unto righteousness, because you're now server, subject to another kingdom, translated from the power of darkness unto the marvelous light with the saints for an inheritance. So we have redemption, and this is through his blood. Without the shedding of blood, no remission of, of anything. So the heavenly things had to be offered. Or rather had to be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What are better sacrifices? The other things, hard sacrifices, God would uh, ordain the bull. So that on the day of the atonement, the priest would have to come in, get a bull, slay it, do the atonement of his house and his own soul. Then after that one, he would go for the atonement of the people, and in this he had to bring two goats. One would be for the Lord of the Lord, another one to be used for the escape goat. That is Leviticus chapter 16. If you just go there, on the day of atonement, you can see what would happen. 
Then after offering the incense and offering the blood of the bull for his own self, because the priest needed himself to, seeing he also was a sinner, born in sin, needed to have this, the word, the atonement for his soul. And when he does that one, then he would come and atone for the peoples. Then he would press his hand upon the escape God. And then he would uh, confess all the sins of his people. And he would put them upon the head of this God. Then he would get the lot of the Lord. And then he would slay it and get the blood. And enter in with that blood into the Holy of Holies. Which should be sprinkled upon the, the mercy seat. When you speak about redemption, when you speak about the blood, you cannot do away with how God used to do it according to the law. Because these things are by law and it is for the justice of God. Only that you through the grace of God, you are getting the imputed, finished work. These people used to have to go and do these works. But you, Christ has entered into the holiest of all to appear before you, before God, with his own blood and all that you should have done within the tabernacle. For now he entered with a better blood, his own blood, God's own blood, and he's doing all the things by, uh, rather unto you, freely, and you, through the faith, you become what? You become subject to all the things and you are purchased, redeemed through this blood. Blood, which is enjoined you by his own, fully paid the purchase. So therefore, no one can condemn me. This is what the priest used to do. Then he would take that blood. Of course, maybe, maybe I can, uh, you see some of the things when you keep paraphrasing, paraphrasing, perhaps uh, you need to reach a time and the submission says, maybe a few scriptures of... Hmm? And uh, Aaron, from verse 8 of uh, Leviticus chapter 16, And Aaron shall cast a lot upon the two gods, a lot for the Lord, and another for the escape god. Aaron shall bring the god upon which the Lord's lot fell, and offer him for the sin offering. So, there is an offering, and it is supposed to be sin. And in this offering, blood should be imposed. And we see in the book of Leviticus, there is the reason why God gave blood. And it should be in Leviticus chapter 17. That's where he speaks about why he gave the blood. Let me just uh, just sorry for bringing these things together because they all must work together so you can be able to trust on the blood of Jesus Christ which is given for your redemption. Why? Leviticus chapter 17 verse 10 he says, And moreover a man, and moreover, and whatsoever man, there be of the house of Israel, of the strangers of the sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So the life of the Redeemer was in the blood. If the word was made flesh, and this flesh offered blood, so the life of the word was in the blood. So the blood has to be spilt. Then he would command that this blood should not be eaten. Why? There is a reason. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. It is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. It is the blood that does the patches, that atones, that ransoms the soul. It is the blood. So yeah, the price is much needed. And now God is speaking, let there be the God, and this God should be the escape God, and there should be, Aaron shall, uh, of course, uh, bring these gods, and uh, one, of course, offer his for sins, and uh, a burnt offering, and so forth, and uh, that in verse 14, he would do that one, and then, uh, then verse 15, then shall he kill the God for the sin offering. From this God, he shall get the blood, which blood is given for the atonement of the soul upon the altar. So if there is the altar of God, God also requires blood to atone for the soul. And here it is for the souls of many. Redemption through his blood. Purchased through the, the ransoming through his blood. Now he speaks and says, Then he shall kill the God for the sin offering that 
is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat before the mass, uh, and before the mercy seat and he shall make an atonement for the holy people because the unclean because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation and that remaineth among them in the midst thereof midst of the uncleanness and there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make the atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his for his household and for the congregation of Israel and he shall go out upon the altar uh, and the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and take the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horn of the altar around about and he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and harrow it and the uncleanness from the uncleanness of the children of Israel and when he shall have made the end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar then he shall bring the life goat and alone shall lay both his hands so what is when the priest is doing these things what is he doing he is fulfilling the work of making peace he is reconciling he is bringing peace that's why we shall go to the book of Ephesians chapter 3 uh, or rather chapter 2 and we see what it means when Christ went on the cross and offered his blood it was to make peace and the Bible says when the priest is doing that one then he is reconciling what? the tabernacle your body is the temple then he is reconciling the tabernacle he is reconciling the people. He is reconciling the, 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 the vessels because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel. And when he does this one, he should stand there alone. That's why Christ had to stand alone. That's why he says, where I'm going, no one can come to me. Because it's of necessity, when he is doing this service, no man should stand there with him. God only, his hand shall route redemption, shall route salvation. He has redeemed thee with his own power. There is no person that is, what, routing with him in this work. It is him alone that has come through his grace to interpose his mass. And he's standing alone in the garden. He's sweating it out. He's going and carrying over the cross. And he's going to the, the what, the, to the Calvary. And he's being hung there alone. And he's sweating it out. And he's pouring his blood out. Because it must be a one priest. Because now King, we see Christ here has become the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. When just got the book of Romans, it, or rather Hebrews, it teaches this Christ being the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he's also doing the priestly duty. And he's offering up. He's cleaning the people. He's reconciling. Now when the Bible says he's given you a church, the minister of reconciliation, he is telling you that take the blood of Jesus Christ and let it also be enjoined upon many people. And this blood was from the word, the word that was made fresh, and it is the blood that makes atonement for the sin. Not your own desire, nor the church's teaching, not anything, no money can be given. Exodus chapter 30, they used to pay money and it would be after the counting of the people. But when it comes to the ransoming of the soul, to you the gentle, there is a precious gift which without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin and it is blood that atones for a soul. Therefore, when he speaketh and his blood has a voice, that's why the Bible says that we have a that the blood of Jesus Christ speaks better things than that of Abel. When Abel's blood was spilled upon this earth, the Bible says God came walking and he told uh, Cain, where is your brother Abel? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, the, the, the ground that has opened its mouth hmm, to drink your brother's blood, it is crying out to me. This blood is crying and is crying for vengeance. It's crying for vengeance. But when Christ offers his blood, it is not crying for vengeance. It is crying, have mercy upon them. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. His blood is crying forgiveness. 
Abel's blood was crying for vigilance so that for God could come in judgment unto Cain and judge him and judge the ground. But when he comes through the blood of Jesus Christ, he does not come to judge you, but rather to tell you that you have been forgiven, the price has been paid, and you can walk free, and you are now no longer any man's servant, and be you no know, servants of men, take care of the sheep of God, which he has enjoined, which he has purchased with his own blood. Therefore, you will be accountable for his blood if you mishandle, misuse what God has just purchased. Be real stewards of the household of God. What? Imparting the grace which has given them upon the people, reconciling them. Because through the blood, the priest would be reconciling the body, the tabernacle, to become the temple of the Holy Ghost. If my body has been reconciled to him, then it should be fine for him to come and make his habitation with me. The God's household, God's building, whose tabernacle, whose building, whose house you are, if you have believed on him. What is God doing? He is reconciling. So the work of reconciliation in whom you have redemption through his blood. It is the blood that is atoning, that has ransomed, that has paid his purchased with his own blood. Now the priest would offer the blood of God. Why did he not offer the blood of lamb? Because when Christ came, he that knew no sin, he became sin. That's the scripture. He that knew no guilt, he became the guilt of all. He became the man of sorrow. God laid upon him all the iniquities of us all. And we esteem him swat smitten, struck by God. It pleased God to smite him to justify you. It is God who took his son and smote him. So he can get the blood to ransom you. This is the grace of God to offer yourself. What? He ransomed. He made peace through the blood of his cross. That's what the priest is doing. He had to be a goat for this reconciliation because he that knew sin, non, he that knew no sin, he became sin. He became this goat. Christ became this goat. He whose nature was a lamb, he became to the nature which was a goat and would be slain. Then on this same goat, the sins would be imparted. Then they would be, of course, you just keep reading. Then when the priest comes out, what? Then Alon, verse 21, shall lay both his hand upon the head of the live God and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of this God and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man unto the wilderness. Then what did Christ do? God put upon him all the sins of the world. He laid up all the guilt that he could bear. Then he sent him to the farthest wilderness. And he could not find that one except to hell itself. Because every sin is supposed to take you to hell. Then this is why the Bible says, when he died, his spirit went into the deeper prison. He reached so far deeper into hell and he sent all the sin back to the owner, back to the what? The, the author of disobedience. Because the price was paid. So this God would be sent to the Father's wilderness where it will never one more time return to the people. Then you could have the people standing and see their sins separated off from them. What a grace, what a wonder. When I stand and see, I know that the blood of Jesus Christ has separated me from the old nature, from the life of sin. One meter, two meter, twenty meter, now not twenty meter, but he sent it back to the original owner, which was certain, and he can no longer hold me guilty because now the sin question has found a ransom, and Christ has become the ransom for us in whom I have redemption through his blood. Therefore, if I trust, I shall be given the life that was in the blood to become a word, to become what? An earnest of salvation until the redemption of this purchased possession. Because this has the program to redeem this. The body is the Lord's, the spirit is the Lord's, the soul is the Lord's. You are the Lord's. That's why the scripture would say, put on the Lord Jesus 
Christ. Everything that you have is His. Nothing you have of your own. Therefore, don't be guilty of the sin of Satan, pride. Humble yourselves before him that has paid the price, that has imputed upon thee righteousness freely. This is the grace of God imputing this righteousness which the priest was performing here. All these that the priest was performing, when God wanted to make peace for you, then Christ performed all these things and he imputes them upon thee freely through his grace. Therefore, you can no longer be any more bondage to any servants of men, to any man. You have been bought with a price. Glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's. In Him, in Christ, there is no other redemption but in Christ. There is no other salvation but in Christ. The church won't save you. The peoples won't save you. Anything that is not in Christ, I tell you, that's why the Bible says that if any man have not his spirit, he <coughs> is none of his. But if the spirit of him that rose Christ from the grave dwell within you, a foundation of the rapture set, he shall also quicken this your mortal body because it is his. What? If I depart, I'm the Lord's. If I be here, I'm the Lord's. Why? Because he has paid my ransoming price. Therefore, no hell can stand. In the times of the Passover, in the times when God instituted the Passover in the days of Egypt, and then he would command the people, I mean, uh, command Moses, command the people to slay the lamb, to the blood upon the post, because it must be blood atone for their soul. God gave blood for the... He never gave nothing else. He gave the blood. Nothing. And this blood is pure. And it is sufficient. And the blood he gave, it is powerful. It is equal to the forgiveness. So how far is my forgiveness as powerful as the Lord Jesus Christ's blood? How long? It is as eternal as the life that was in the blood. How long should I live after here? I will live as long as the life that was in the blood lives. Can God therefore condemn me if he would condemn that the price of the blood was not sufficient? Do I require any other sacrifice to offer except my body to present it? Other than that one, there is no nothing I can give. Nothing in my hand I give. Open hearted do I come to you. And to the cross, by the cross, he has reconciled me back to my father. Why? Because I was originally his. That's why we had the book, the book, the, in the book of Ephesians. He ordained before the foundation of the world. He presented us unto the adoption of children. That's why when we speak about the Lamb slain, it is slain not now, but before the foundation of the world. God knew, the all-knowing God knew that when we come here, something is going to be not right. For Him to portray His attributes of redemption, then he allowed in his mind he knew there's going to be a same question and he ordained the lamb before the foundation of the world and at the end of the time he has appeared to fulfill that which was ordained for therefore when you appear fulfill that which you ordained for that is taking on the name of Jesus Christ taking on the life which is in the blood because in the blood all that we require is the life and it is life that ransoms for life yes if there is a life that was going to hell, then there has to be another life that takes its position. He has to take your position. He has to take your place. Then you can be able to stand in the righteousness of God. That's why he became the sinner that you should be the righteousness of God. That's why there is the blood, that uh, there is the God that will have all the sins of the people confessed upon it and sent into the Father's wilderness. That's what Christ did. And this is a condelo and the righteousness of the law. Christ has fulfilled and imputed it upon thee. The book of Romans is a foundational book for all these things. To whom it should be imputed if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The righteous requirement of the law for the forgiveness of sin. This is the justification of God. It's God justice. It is a judicial act. It is where the judge must stand there. It is where someone has come and he wants to stand in for this person that is guilty. 
And the justification of God says you have to pay the price. And he fully paid it. That's what we are just looking at in the scriptures. Then this God would have the sins confessed and would be sending the Pharisees and the God shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited and he shall let go the God in the wilderness and Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put on the linen garment. Then the service as you can continue reading. But what is happening in Christ? We have forgiveness. What? <clears throat> the forgiveness that we have is equal to the blood that was offered. Do you think there is a need of modification? Could you modify the price that God was give, has given? Then could you modify life? Then could you modify the way to receive it? If according to the book of Galatians, receive ye this gift. Hmm? Galatians chapter 3. He speaks about how they would <coughs> have this life applied upon them. Chapter 3. Foolish Galatians. Hmm? Who has bewitched you? That he should not obey the truth. Wherefore, whose eyes Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. it has been crucified. No only this only would I learn of you. Receive the spirit by the work of the law or by the hearing of the faith. O oh, foolish, are you so foolish? Having begun the spirit, are you not being made perfect in the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Therefore, he that ministers to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, does he eat by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? How is God imparting this life that was in the blood upon us by the hearing of faith? If I fast so many days, you may fast and come out without this thing. He imparts the spirit that was in the blood by the hearing of faith. We become partakers of this redemption by the hearing of faith. Israel, wishing to establish their own righteousness, were not subject to the righteousness of God. They stumbled at how God wants to impute righteousness upon them. But we, if through the faith shall believe on these things, then should be imputed. My friend, through the faith which is of God. <clears throat> what is it? Hebrews chapter 10. He speaks something here and says that and their sins and iniquities from verse 17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of this is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, we have access by the blood of Jesus Christ. Maybe perhaps we shall look on what the blood has won for us. He has given access. He has given reconciliation. He has given us life. The life for the karma thereof. Hmm? How much the blood of Jesus Christ will be able to purge our conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. It is some purges conscience because the life that was in the bulls and goats couldn't come back upon the worshiper. Why was there a necessity of a better sacrifice? If you offer the goat, the life of the goat wouldn't come upon the worshiper. After all, the worshiper and the goat, something, couldn't have their life and justification. No one of them could justify any. So God could bring forth a perfect sacrifice that the life that is in the sacrifice should be transferred upon the worshiper. The life of God couldn't be transferred upon the worshiper. But when we speak about Christ Jesus, we speak about the life of Christ being transformed. Trans Interposed upon the worshipper in this sense. Coming upon the worshipper. So we are speaking that he is a better sacrifice, and in the blood, all we require is the life that is in the blood to give us access. The life that is in the blood. 
How do we get this life? By one spirit. We become partakers of this life. The word that I speak to you, the word is life. And the word is spirit. The word was made fresh. He gave the blood. And by this blood, you have reconciliation and atonement. And the blood of Jesus Christ gives the life of Jesus Christ. And through the belief of faith, you have become partakers of this life, which is now the Holy Ghost. So therefore, it is a great sanctification that came by the blood. It is great honor, great glorification. It is God changing your position. It is God taking you to access, rather, having this boldness enter in. He is sanctifying thee from the life of slavery and sin and to the acceptance. We have the success, the book of Romans speak it, chapter 5. We have success, the book of Hebrews speak it, I mean the book of uh, Ephesians. We have boldness and access into his holiness, into this salvation, through the blood. How? By the way which he has consecrated for us, which is through his veil, through his flesh, he offered the blood, and he consecrated the way, wherein you have redemption, the redeemed must have the journey to take, unto the inheritance. When you watch the journey of Israel, the blood has been offered in Egypt, and then he redeems them, and then he brings them through the wilderness. He gives them instruction. He teaches them. He matures them. They have to walk a walk of redeemed. Until they should go over to the canals and to inherit it. It is we that has been called. And we are now in the life of service of the redeemed. Until we should go to the heavenly things which he has sanctified with his own blood. Therefore, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Meaning, when there was aliens. As it is in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Hmm? What? Wherefore, verse 11. Remember that he bearing in time past. Genders in the flesh. Who are called uncircumcision, uncircumcision. By that which is called circumcision. In the flesh. Made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ. Having boldness. We were without past. Christ, in the time past, before his blood, you was without Christ. What? Bearing aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You wasn't anything from the inheritance of Israel. The God of Israel wasn't your God. You was just there. I delayed us having nothing. What more? He says that. And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He's giving us access. One who never had God in the world. But now, that was the time past. But now, now things have changed. What is it? But now, in Christ, you have, you were sometimes a far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Redemption through his blood. You can never do anything. You can never replace it with anything. Don't you try to replace the blood, the work which was done by God on the cross, that is imputing upon the worshipper and replace it with any holier than thou attitudes. It is irreplaceable. He is now reconciled us by his blood. Hmm? By midnight, by his blood. We have access through his blood. One more. By a new and a living way which has consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, he is fresh and having a an high priest over the household of God. Let us join that with a true, true heart and for assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience that our bodies washed with the pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that has Promised. This is what he has done to us through his blood. That's why the Bible is speaking. That, But now in Christ, you are sometimes afar off and midnight by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, you have redemption. You have reconciliation. You have the forgiveness of sin. Your death has been purchased. The life has been given. Eternal life has been given through his blood. If you don't drink this blood, you have no life within you because it's my life that atoned for your life. That's why you value the atonement you get because it is the life of Christ that atoned for your own life. This is why I believe the Lord Jesus Christ that I believe Him above everything no matter what I lose or what I gain, my friend, because the life of Jesus Christ atoned for my life. I was supposed to die. He knew my place. He gave me His own. 
He knew my sins. He imparted me righteousness. He took my sickness. He gave me power and liberty. He took me out of the darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. He purchased this possession, this access. Now I'm no longer a slave to anything. Now I'm a son. If a son, then a heir of God through Christ, joint heirs with him. How? Through his blood. In whom we have redemption, the purchase he has been joined us with his blood. He has a claim upon us. That's why he's coming back in the rapture to take away his claim. That's why I know I'm not my own. I'm someone's. That's why I glorify him that has called me above every people. That's why I'm not a servant of no man. Because I was born in the place. I know it was fully paid. Therefore, I don't need no man to take on that position. No, not at all. He's fully paid this, this, uh, this price, this purchase. Power has been given. When you speak about the goel, you speak about someone that was worthy enough to pay the price. When you look on Boaz, becoming kinsman, redeemer to Luth, he has to be worthy enough. He has to be willing. And he has to be a right person. To me, I never needed him to be the, of the tribe of Judah. All I needed was him to be God. Israel needed a tribe of Judah to come for their redemption because it is associated with the kingdom. But to me, I need my God to come because I never had a God to, to begin with. Now I should have this God and him only could come and seek me. He is this great shepherd that come and is worthy enough. The worthiness of my salvation is equal to the blood of Jesus Christ. The confidence I have is equal to the boldness of him lifting that, that, that cloth and going there and making, the, making sure that every one of my sin is atoned for. And he makes sure that when I come, I should no longer be afraid of anything, but rather trust on him. That's what the Bible says. When I trusted on him, he gave me the Holy Spirit because I knew he began a good work. He shall complete it. That's why I have the trust in the blood of Jesus Christ by a new and a living way, which has consecrated through his faith, that we should have access. What has he done over here? We that were sometimes afar, but now in Jesus Christ, you who sometimes were afar of, are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. How near have we been made? That God is now pleased to give us the inheritance of his. That God can live within us. That we can become the temple. So much near until our conversation is in heaven. So much near until we are the very body of Christ. So much near until Christ is the head of this new creature. So much near that there is no, no condemnation. So much near until he counts us for a new creature. So much near until nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So much near until none of those things move me. So much near I count all things but laws that I should know him and the power of his resurrection. He took God's justice. And to me, he imputed this justification of life freely through his grace. I do anything? Nothing. If I should it was by works, then it should no longer of faith. But if it is of faith, then it should no longer of works. Otherwise, faith is not faith. Him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies freely, his faith is counted for righteousness. So what he has done to us? What has he done more? For he is our peace. He has reconciled. Just as the priest would take the bull, would take the incense, would take the blood of gods, and he's supposed to reconcile the tabernacle from the sins unto God. That God should come among any more, well, I mean, should come among them one more time. By that time I never heard Christ. But he has given a perfect sacrifice and he has reconciled me. What? He for is a peace who has both who has made both one. Who? Who is this both? Both Jew and Gentile. He has made us one. How has he done it? He has made us to meet in the body, which is the body of Christ. Where there's no Jew, there's no Gentile, no woman, no man, no Scythian, no anything but a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. This is our peace. Hmm? What? 
he has broken down the middle wall of partition or between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, containing ordinances, for to make in himself of twine one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. He has reconciled unto God in one body by the cross. He has slain the enmity. The enmity that was contained ordinances, anything that was enemy with us. Without the law, sin is not sin. But the law is the strength of sin. And the sting of sin is death. He slew the enmity thereof. Therefore, I can speak, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who has won to us this great victory when we believe on him. What has he done? This is what he's done. He's reconciled. As the priest would reconcile the people. So he's reconciled us. We that was aliens now have been made nigh. Now it's the time for us to be nigh. Now we have access, consecrated the way through his veil. Hmm? And he has reconciled us unto God by the cross. And came and preached peace unto you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. When he preached peace, then we also become partakers of this glory through the belief of the truth and the spirit which he sends to us for the confirmation of our belief of the truth. He glorifies us by that. He makes us to partake of this glory through the belief of the truth. What a work when it comes to the redemption that he has given through his blood is something that you can speak over for the whole year and you can never exhaust what the blood of Jesus Christ has done, what left made God to take on flesh, what caused the Son of God to cry in Calvary and say, Father, Father, why art thou forsaken me? Because it had to be an exact payment to me the justice that God required upon the forgiveness of sin. So if any person can undermine your forgiveness, then remember they are undermining the blood. If there's anything that can undermine the blood, then it can be there to undermine your forgiveness. If the blood of Jesus Christ was sufficient, so am I sufficiently forgiven. Standing before God as pure, holy as He is. That's what the Bible says. What? He came and preached peace, who are nigh of. For through Him, we have access by one spirit and the Father. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fully framed together, grows unto a holy temple, or in the Lord, in whom he also are builded, Together for an habitation of God through the Spirit in whom we have redemption through His blood. The blood has done to us <coughs> great things, greater than you can ever speak. He has given us this access. Hmm? Because it is the one that makes atonement for us. Our forgiveness is equal to the blood of Jesus Christ and palm as perfect and complete as the satisfying sacrifice of God's own person, Jesus Christ, in his suffering. It is as eternal as God who gave his life in his blood. The life that you live is no longer yours. It's the life of the blood. That's why Paul would say that I'm dead. No longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. I live by the faith of the Son of God, which loved me, separated me, done all these things. This is why the Bible in the book of uh, Ephesians, he said that in him we have this redemption, which is equal to the forgiveness of sins. God would have stood in heaven and said that all the people in the world are forgiven you come in. But he couldn't do it. It requires a price to meet this forgiveness. That's why the wage of not accepting this price is nothing but eternal fire. 
the wages of not accepting the payment of this price. Whosoever, for God so loved that he gave, that whosoever believeth on him should no longer perish. They should be passed from life, from death unto life. This is what caused him to ransom, to pay with his own blood. My brethren, this is why you have to trust on him. Trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now we may not have any more literal blood or for to touch. But the evidence of the blood is the life that he gives us through his spirit. Through his word. It is the evidence of life that the sacrifice of God was paid in full. This is what evidences that we are his and he is forever. So in him we have this forgiveness. It is equal to the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why Colossians say that the forgiveness of sin, even the forgiveness of sin, even the blood uh, we have this uh, redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. It is equal to the forgiveness of sin. Thus, if justice, if through justice forgiveness was given then the failure to accept justice of God will end up into the everlasting punishment. My brethren, when it is called today, when the world is already gone in conflict, Jesus Christ is still reconciling in his body by the cross through his blood to give peace to anyone who will. That's why he says, whosoever will, let him come and take this water freely that he giveth. That's why in the Bible, in the book of Ephesians, I think, should be chapter 5. Hmm? He gave such words. Ephesians chapter 5. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He gave himself for it. Christ loved his body and gave his self for it. All that he was, he gave it. Hmm? that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by, his, by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without brim. The blemish was taken when Christ agreed to take the brim that you owned. When Christ agreed to give you the grace by taking the brim that you deserved, that's when the brim was taken from you. That's why there's no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now we have redemption through his blood. But we don't accept it. If we don't accept it, then we shall have condemnation by the reason of disobedience. And who will do it? Already sin will be found in thee. And remember, on the last day, God is coming to destroy anything where sin is found. If sin is found in death, death shall go into the eternal fire. If sin is found in hell, hell shall be thrown into the eternal fire. If sin is found in Lucifer, Lucifer shall fall into the eternal fire. If sin is found in the angels, then these angels, my friend, should be thrown to the eternal fire. If sin is found in anyone whose name is not in the book of life, then they also should fall. Because God is just judging sin, not a person, not a, any human being. He's judging sin and in a vessel where the sin will be found, surely should be judged. And God is sanctifying what? The righteousness of God. And in a vessel wherein this righteousness is imputed, God shall sanctify it, shall glorify it. Therefore, you were bought with a price. In Him, you have redemption, even the forgiveness of sin, which is a great thing. That's why we believe on Him, Jesus Christ, who has done that. And this one is according to the riches of His grace. The riches of His grace is what has caused Him to come and pay this blood, to come and pay the purchase, to give the ransom for our salvation. Therefore, let no man beguile you through any voluntary worship of angels and beguile you of the reward that is in Christ. Let any person not present anything but the blood of Jesus Christ. 
It is it that ransomed for your soul. It is it that gave you the Holy Spirit. It is it that God laid your sin upon. It is it that took your place. It is it. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Accept this gift of God through the shed blood. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless every person. Till we meet in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Gracious Lord, with these few things, may the people understood that you have imputed to us the righteousness through the shed blood which the high priest has concluded all and performed and fulfilled and certified the righteous requirement of the law and is imputing to us this life if we only can believe. Father, the karmas thereof should be purged from sin to serve the living God. In the blood of Jesus Christ that speak better things is our reconciliation, is our peace, is our forgiveness, is our life. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for this act of the riches of the grace. Not because of blood per se, but because of He that gave the blood. Thank you, Jesus Christ. We accept this. May it be a pride upon our lives. Father, may we ever live, Father, never to lose the wonder of the cross. Never to lose the power of the cross. Never to lose, O oh Father, what you did to us on the cross. May not man do anything to shed us from the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father, may we not be shaken by anything, but know it's sufficient, and we, our sufficiency is in thee. Grant thee things. I pray for mercy upon Israel, mercy upon your children, especially in such a great hour of conflict. Bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray.